You know, we talk a lot about influencer marketing software on this show. And the worst thing about it for a lot of you is that influencer marketing software for small businesses is too expensive, right? Well, Reach Influencers solves that problem. Now your small business can find, engage, and manage micro and nano influencers, the ones you can afford to work with. And Reach Influencers costs as low as $100 per month. Are you kidding me? No, it's true. Go to CaptureTheInfluence.com slash podcast and see for yourself. Find, engage, manage, influence with software built and priced for your sized business. CaptureTheInfluence.com slash podcast. On this episode of Winfluence. You don't want to necessarily start a relationship with an influencer and say, hey, we're going to hire you for X amount of time to do like a ton of posts for us. Because if you've never used that influencer before, you don't know, A, are they going to be able to create content for your brand that works well? And B, is their audience the right fit? There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. The influencer marketing space is overrun with agencies and marketplaces and software solutions and such. It's hard for a brand to find the right partner to actually solve the specific problem they have that influence can address. Case in point, I reached out to a talent agency last week, you know, the one that manages talent like celebrities and influencers. But I made the mistake of using the term talent management in my email. I was quickly lectured on the fact they do not provide management services, they provide talent services. Well, excuse me, I certainly won't be needing either of those services from you or your talent. I guess you didn't want your folks to work with the brands that I work with, I guess, to each their own. When you actually narrow down a category of providers in the space, let's say an influencer marketing agency category, the water doesn't get much clearer. There are agencies that build out influencer campaigns and hire and manage talent. Then there are agencies that do strategy. Then there are agencies that only manage talent and mislabel themselves as agencies. Some agencies also have software, which confuses everyone. I suppose part of my job on this podcast is to help better define who is what and what is right for various challenges. Which brings me to today's guest, who has solved quite a number of problems for a lot of brands over the years. Elisa Freud is the CEO of She Speaks. It bills itself as a community of women, not an agency. So that means you can go there to find creators who might partner with your brand. But it started as a consumer insights or research firm where brands could find a focus group of women consumers to inform their marketing and product decisions. It has kept that part of its DNA. So She Speaks is a community of creators and consumers you can tap into for insights to help your brand's marketing and product decisions, but also to leverage those research panel participants and others in the community to turn around and share your brand with their audiences. Elisa and I talked about the nuances of She Speaks and how both creators and brands can benefit from the community. Then we jumped into a really interesting and useful discussion about building influence marketing strategies overall. I think you're going to get a lot out of today's conversation with Elisa Freud. Quickly, though, let me tell you a little something more today about Winfluence's presenting sponsor, Tagger. It is a complete influencer marketing management solution. It's a software for you. With Tagger, you can find, engage, hire, collaborate, review, and measure all of your influence marketing efforts. I kicked out a report this week and made sure to plug my costs into each creator's data. That meant the report that I sent to the client had cost per thousand impressions, cost per engagement, cost per view, and all those other metrics the management team likes all baked into just the influence marketing report. Now, I could go on and on about Tagger. You know I've done it before, but you know I use it every day. You know I love it. You should check it out, too. It might be right for your brand or agency. Go to jason.online slash Tagger to get a free demo and see if Tagger is right for you. That's jason.online slash Tagger. The opportunities of not just engaging influencers, but a community of creators for R&D, consumer insights, and more. Elisa Freud of She Speaks is next on Winfluence. LinkedIn believes B2B marketing can be B2 brilliant, B2 bold, 
and B2 Breakthrough. How? With a platform purpose built to make B2B mean more for your business. A platform with tools to help you build better relationships with your key customers, to boost your buyer journey while building your brand. A platform with the trusted data and lead generation you need to beat KPIs, drive ROI, and stand out amongst the competition. And with the targeting tools on LinkedIn, you can reach your precise audience right down to their job title, company name, location, and more to make sure your ads are always being seen by those who matter. So get ready to be to boldly go where no marketers have gone before. Because LinkedIn is where B2B is everything it can be. Rethink your B2B marketing LinkedIn ads and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Aliza, before we get into She Speaks and, and what all you do, because uh, you your your company serves both creators and brands, I think, in really interesting ways. But I, I want to start farther back from that. Tell us about your path to becoming the CEO of this community of creators and consumers. How'd you get into all this mess? <laughs> I like that you're calling it a mess. Um, so I, I am what you call a, a career marathoner. I've only worked two places in my entire career. Um, I, and, and I'm certainly, um, you know, I've certainly been out there in the workforce for a while. So I think that's a little bit unusual for people, certainly in this day and age. I started the first part of my career. I spent at American Express doing all different kinds of marketing um, that there was to do there, product development and marketing and portfolio management. And the reason I, I kind of decided that there was an opportunity to work with, with, with humans and as it related to digital was because we were finding at American Express, we always had this saying at American Express that when somebody has a great experience with our customer service, they have a great experience with our brand, they were, are likely to tell uh, five other people. When someone had a bad experience, they were likely to tell 10. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I was working on before um, I left the company was an initiative that, again, this is back in 2006. So we're early days of digital. Um, and the idea was, okay, we know that our customers, our card members, are advocates. How can you harness the power of that advocacy in a bigger way and use digital to do it? So that was the start of the idea. One of the things, though, that I noticed as we started looking at our card members who were talking about our brand, uh, a lot of them were women. A lot of them were women. And so it, came, it, uh, it occurred to me that there was an opportunity for brands to better understand what was going on with women because this was an area that was interesting to me. Research was always an area of interest. And so when I came up with the idea for She Speaks, the initial idea was, hey, let's get a group of women together, almost as like a panel, a research panel. Mm -hmm. And let's see if they can use their insights, their influence to share with us what they think about brands. And we'll go back to those brands and tell them all about that. So that was really how we started. We started as a research platform. And what happened though, was we realized pretty quickly that the women who were signing up to be on this panel were what you now call influencers. So we had 30,000 bloggers within eight months of us launching. There were 30,000 bloggers who were signed up to be members of She Speaks and to provide feedback and insights. And if you think about it, it makes sense because the MO of somebody who blogs, who is, you know, has a social media presence that they they hone over time and, and create content for over time, these are people who have something that they want to say and they want to hear, they want people to hear it. So it's not surprising that those were the same women who were signing up to be on our panel. And so it really became something that evolved over time. Um, but we realized there was an opportunity not just to get insights from our community that was growing, but also to use that community to potentially help brands build um, affinity and awareness for their products um, over time. 
Very nice. So that makes sense to me then why you're sort of billed as a diverse community of female consumers and influencers. But let's get past kind of the industry speak and the marketing jargon here. Help us understand the different functions and audiences you serve. What are the three or four things She Speaks primarily does? So at the heart of everything we do, we serve the community. We are nothing without the community. So that is what we spend our days thinking about um, is, you know, what's going on with the community? How, what are their pain points? What is, uh, what is, what is on their minds? And then we figure out based on that, how do we serve the community but knowing that we have another core constituent, which are these brands that we work with, that are looking to tap into the power of the community. So at the heart of it, we see our primary partner as our community members. And that is good for our clients, for our brands, because if we did not see that that community as our primary partner, we wouldn't be as good at what we did. And that, um, I think, is the thing that we spend um, the majority of our time thinking about. Uh, where are our community members? They they are the ones that show us what is happening next. I'd like to say that we, we have a wonderful team, but at the end of the day, we are, I think the smartest thing we do is listen to the community. So if they say, hey, we're starting to create content like Reels, like TikToks that, that they started telling us about a few years ago, we were like, wait a second. Second. Nobody's on TikTok, but but young people. Like who's on TikTok? And then pandemic happens, and of course everybody's on TikTok. So it's um, I'd say that the 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 audience we serve is the community and the you know the, our creators and our our women in our community. And there's benefit to the brands and everyone else that we get to partner with um, by virtue of that relationship we have with the community. Okay, so let me let me jump a couple steps, and and I think I would be able to assume some some things here, but the fact that you came from American Express and you started almost as a research platform kind of throws a layer of okay, I can't make assumptions here on what all this means. So, tell me exactly how brands interact with She Speaks first. You know, mm-hmm. they come to you and they you know want you to they, they want to hire a bunch of influencers or they want people to review their products or tell me what brands get out of it. And then after you clarify that, tell me what the community members get out of being a part of She Speaks. OK, so the brands come to us for a variety of reasons. Uh, one thing could be, hey, we are looking for influencers to create content for us and to build awareness and sales for our brands. So that is one ask that they come to us with. Another thing, though, is they need reviews. And because we know where you shop. So we have CRM is the underpinning of everything that our platform does. And so every time you interact as a community member, every time you interact with our platform, we get smarter about who you are. What that helps us do is then identify if a client comes to us and they're a a uh, granola brand and they want reviews on walmart.com. We know who shops at Walmart. We know if they shop for granola type products and that allows us to very quickly find the right people to create that content. So what we do is we focus on making sure we have lots of insights and information about who the community members are. And the thing where we marry the insights, the research part of how we started and the, and the, influencer activation, if you want to call it like these influencer campaigns, the way that we marry those two things is every single campaign we work on, we start with a research study. And it's a quick, we can do it very quickly because the tools are built into the platform. We have the panel of people. We will go out to the target audience for the product and we will find out how do they buy the product? What do they think about when they buy the product? What are the benefits of the product? And the reason that those things are so important is because it then informs how we do everything else in the campaign. How do we choose people? How do we help brief them so that they can create content that's going to work that, you know, is the 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 sweet spot between what 
the client is looking to achieve, what messaging they want to convey, and what the influencer knows, which is how to convey benefit-driven messages to their audience. So those are the things that that's how we now marry the research part of, of what we know how to do and the influencer marketing campaigns, which is the other part of what we get to do. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Now, I think I can almost anticipate the answer to this question, but I'm curious um, on the outset, or I'm, I think I can anticipate the answer to this question in terms of what you recommend to brands, but I want to back up a little bit and ask what percentage of a brand's initial ask of you, how many, what percentage of brands are coming to you saying, we want consumer insights, we want research, we want access to your you know, community for a focus group kind of thing versus how many are coming and saying, we want to give them product and have them review it or post content on social media about it. Um, the majority of our campaigns are influencer campaigns. So okay. client comes to us and says, we want to activate a group of influencers to help us promote this particular brand, or we want content for our retail partner or our own site. Those are typically the asks, but because everything they know that we start with insight, that is a key reason I think that the clients who work with us come to us over and over again because they know it's driven that way. I can give you an example if that's helpful. Please. This, um, during, so so take take ourselves back to November of 2020, right? We are living with COVID now. Wait, we, wait, wait. Do we have living. to? Do we have to go <laughs> no, back to this, sorry. please? I'm sorry to take us back <laughs> all the way there. But it's, it's actually, you know, an interesting um, exercise because – it was a first for all of us. I mean, nobody had dealt with the holiday season during a pandemic before, right? Nobody had dealt with any of the holidays. So take us, so we go back to October, let, let, let's say October of 2020. We're dealing with COVID now for several months. And one of our clients um, is a, uh, a chocolate brand, um, that a confectionery brand you might know named Hershey's. And they said to us, okay, we have all of this product in store. I mean, we made candy for hollo you know, for Halloween. It's it's gonna be, you know, it's it's a season that is a big season for confectionery brands, right? That's one of the biggest seasons. But they had no idea, because it's a pandemic, whether people were going to go into store and buy these products and were they going to celebrate Halloween? Is anyone going to want to celebrate Halloween when we're dealing with a pandemic? So we ended up um, doing some research with the community and asking their target audience, hey, what are you planning for Halloween this year? And what we found out is that women that we asked, the women we talked to, were hell-bent on, on having their kids have some sort of celebration for Halloween, whether it, it was going to maybe look different than it was bef than they had before, but they were going to celebrate. They were going to find ways to celebrate. We were able to use that as how to inform how we developed this campaign and also gave, you know, Hershey a great uh, data point on okay, let's do this. Let's move forward with like everything we were planning to see if we can, um, you know, build momentum for Halloween. And it was a hugely successful Halloween for them because they were one of the few brands that went in all in on Halloween. And it was a, you know, it was a highly successful, uh, highly successful period for them. And um, it was, it's, it, it's helpful to have that insight when you are planning for things like that. So, so, and you don't always have to have a pandemic for that to be the reason that you need to do some research. <laughs> but I think that's the reason that we end up working with a lot of our clients over and over again, because they know that even if it's just, hey, what's the best way to get, bring this campaign to life in social media? that they will get those insights by, by, by just taking the time to ask people because people will tell you if you ask them. Yeah, they will. And it, it's, it's always amazing to me how few brands actually start with what do we know about our consumers? What are those insights that can inform our campaign? And it's not just brands that are at fault. It's also agencies too, because brands will go to agencies and say, okay, we need to come up with a campaign for this year, or we need a, you know, a revamp on our marketing strategy. And if the agency's not, you know, sort of 
conditioned to think strategic planning and insights first, then they'll go, oh, here's a bunch of creative. We think it'll work. And, you know, some most more often than not, it doesn't because it's not insights driven. So you've got an, and, and that's certainly true for, you know, above the line advertising campaigns, overall marketing strategy, but it's certainly also true for influencer campaigns. And you've kind of got the best of both worlds there with not only a mechanism to get insights, but insights from actual creators and influencers who can inform the brands. Good stuff. We are talking to Elisa Freud. She is the CEO of She Speaks, an amazing community of female consumers that can benefit brands a number of ways. When we come back, I want to turn our attention slightly and get some really actionable ideas from Elisa. One thing she is going to tell us is how to build an always-on influencer approach for your business. Don't go away. How can you change the world, build a company, or establish an industry if no one knows you exist? Marketing makes you exist. The Space Marketing Podcast is where we explore marketing principles, strategies, and tactics through the lens of space. Join me, Izzy House, as we talk with industry professionals about their challenges and successes with marketing in the new space economy. Subscribe at spacemarketingpodcast.com or look for the Space Marketing Podcast wherever you listen. Back with Elisa Freud from She Speaks, one of the core components of a good social media strategy that I've recommended and implemented for clients over the years is this sort of foundational layer of social content that I and the people at Cornette have always called you're always on content. It's just kind of the stuff that always has to be there. Elisa, you have a concept of developing an always on approach to influencers. Tell us what that means and maybe how we can do it too. Sure. So... Let me start by saying with influencers, you first, you don't want to necessarily start a relationship with an influencer and say, hey, we're going to hire you for X amount of time to do like a ton of posts for us. Because if you've never used that influencer before, you don't know, A, are they going to be able to create content for your brand that works well? And B, is their audience the right fit? So those are the two major things that we tend to look at when we're looking at influencers. Now, let's say you have used an influencer, a group of influencers, and you find you do a campaign, you have, let's say, five, 10 influencers in it. You see that, you know, three of them are really doing well for you. They get it. The content is great that they are that they are pushing out about your product or service, and their audience seems to really resonate with the message that they are sending. Now, if you have those two things in place, so it's good content at, for your brand and the audience is the right audience, then an always-on approach with that influencer can be really helpful because it's the same thing with any other form of advertising or marketing. It's the frequency idea. If you can use an influencer to, to, who has a a decent size audience to have a steady drip of content and messaging to their community about your brand, it can be a very powerful message because, I mean, look, think about the way we do digital ads. You know, you don't just do one digital ad in one (laughs) spot. You're looking for a frequency. Uh, When I, back in the days when I was still doing direct mail, there was a frequency with doing that direct Mm -hmm. mail. You didn't send people just one piece of, of mail. So at the end of the day, it's a very similar concept as, as, um, as other forms of marketing where you want some frequency. Again, you have the right influencer who's giving you good content with the right audience. Having a frequency of message can be very powerful. And it also, then you get the benefit, you get that halo benefit where if the audience, their audience starts to see them associated with your brand enough they're going to remember your brand a lot more. Every time they see the influencer, it's going to be a reminder. Every time they see your brand, it's a reinforcement. So they become mutually reinforcing for one another. Well, and that certainly parallels the advice we've given here on this show consistently, which is, you know, we've, we're gone, long gone are the days of sponsored posts. You know, we're, we're beyond this one-off, I want to see my brand, a product shot in your stream, and then I'm going to move on to another influencer. We've you know constantly preached here about, developing those longer term relationships with those influencers, as you indicated, that sort of show early on that there is a synergy. I hate that word, but there is a synergy between the influencer's audience 
and the influencer and your brand. And it makes a lot of sense. And I've worked with a number of these now where you're, you're not negotiating an influencer, you know, marketing sort of content package of, I want this many Instagram reels and this many blog posts and this many X I'm, I'm negotiating like monthly retainers for 12 months. Like we want to use you for a year and we're going to define the content maybe as we go along. I wonder, is that the same kind of thing you're seeing as a trend? Maybe not so much from what the influencers prefer, but what the brands prefer. They're kind of coming at it from a smarter angle these days, at least in my experience. I wonder if it's the same for you. Um, it depends on the type of uh, person you're dealing with at a brand um, or agency, let's say, right? Because there's so many players in this space right now. If you are dealing with a part of the marketing organization within a brand that is focused on, let's say, driving you into a store to go buy a product for some seasonal reason, then they're going to be a little bit more focused on a one and done right? Oh, I just need a bunch of people to drive people into this store to buy my product during 4th of July, uh, you know, making that up. But that in that instance, what you're going to look to do, and as, as, our, as their partner, we would say, yeah, you don't necessarily need people doing this always on uh, 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 approach for you. But if you're dealing more with a, a brand or a part of the a part of the marketing team that is looking to build a steady drumbeat with that air cover of of co- of constant frequent messaging then in those instances yes looking at a approach where people are working with you on an ongoing basis then those can be those can work really well i will say one other thing about this which is it also depends on the product or service that you're talking about there are products that have their services and products that have they're so ubiquitous people know them do how do you really use influencers to build awareness in those instances right that's that's a different approach but when you're talking about a, a product let's say you're talking about a insurance product having somebody who can maybe go through the process of hey i'm considering life insurance I'm at an age where I'm thinking about it. I just had a kid. Okay, so now I'm going to find some life insurance. Oh, I spoke to an advisor. This is what they told me. Then having multiple posts where you're taking them through a journey, that can be incredibly valuable. So it, I wish um, I wish I could say that there is a constant you know, a way to do it for everything. But like everything else, as my accounting professor in, in business school used to say, when you ever, he asked you a question, the answer was always, always it depends. It depends. That's right. <laughs> so I think that's the bottom line is you just have to think about the nuances of what you're trying to achieve um, and what type of service or product you're, you're promoting. Sure. And I, I love the fact that you started to tap into, you know, sort of insurance as an example, because when I looked at the, um, when I looked at the brands you've worked with, I noticed a tendency, but this is not uncommon among influencer marketing agencies and communities and whatnot. I noticed a tendency for them to be more consumer brands that, you know, probably focus a lot more on the transaction transactional side of, of, of things in terms of results they want to get out of influencer work. I think that the market is shifting or I've seen the market shift from my perspective anyway, to a, to prioritize conversions for influencer marketing, even though, I've always said influencer marketing is far more suitable for awareness and branding, that longer term play. It, it can be used for transactions. Not, no, I'm not saying it can't. I'm just saying it's a little bit better suited for that more relational, um, you know, sort of human approach. How do you move an influencer's audience through that funnel, though, to not just be aware of the product and maybe even consider a product to actually purchasing it? What's, what's the, what are the funnel dynamics of influencer marketing, if you will? Okay. Well, I love that you're asking this question because one of the things that I spent a lot of time when I was working at a large company doing branding was, you know, we really focus on that purchase funnel going all, you know, from awareness down, down the funnel to purchase. What are the different channels that we're going to use to, to do that above the line? 
right? What all of our television, that spots, all of that was really meant for top of the funnel awareness. Direct mail, <laughs> which I know I referenced also, was much more of the uh, ac- acquiring a customer. It was, but you, the direct mail benefited from all of these stuff we were doing above the line, right? So in those days, we thought about the purchase funnel and the channels as each part of the purchase funnel or was probably a discrete channel. Now, I think what happened with, with, with digital and with influencer marketing in particular is I do think you have been able to, you can take people from awareness to purchase with one or two pieces of content. You can collapse that funnel, but it has to be done. Um, it has to be done in the right way. You have to start with benefit driven content right? Not not feature-driven. I think that's one of the things that happens in marketing a lot, especially as somebody who came from a brand. You fall in love with your features. That you, you sort of fall in love with the product features. Consumers don't care about the features. They care about how this product is going to make my life better, easier, funnier, more interesting, whatever that is. That's what they care about. And I think what influencers do really well is they focus on benefit, And so what that does is somebody sees it and they go, yes, I agree. That is something I want those benefits. And then if you are smart about placing a call to action within the content in a place that makes sense, you can get people to convert. So we work with Prudential. We work with Fidelity. We work with uh, a lot of service-based businesses and they are absolutely seeing influencer content not drive top of the funnel as well as bottom of the funnel. Now you have it has to be done correctly. It's longer form content. There are there are different ways to do it, but you can collapse that purchase funnel um, by using by using a piece or, or a couple pieces of content. Isn't it also though true that the the other the X factor in whether or not a campaign is going to be successful, no matter how much the influencer col- collapses that funnel in their in their content, it's also true though that the consumer in question has to be, you know, at least teed up to buy. They have to be they they have to need the product, or they have to think they need the product, or they have to be sort of in shopping mode. One of my criticisms about the transactional approach to influencer marketing, I, I constantly remind my clients when people go to social media channels, they're not there to shop. They're there to be social. If you do a good job of hitting the right audience at the right time with that message through social, then yeah, bully for you, you get you get a new customer. But there's only a certain percentage of customers that are going to do that because you've got to hit that consumer at the right time. Yes, absolutely. And that's why one of the things that we're seeing smart brands doing, and we most I'd say that the majority of our campaigns do this now as well, is the organic content gets pushed out. So the influencers create the content, it gets pushed out. We track which content's performing the best. Then based on that, you take that content and you use it in lots of other ways. You use it in paid, right? You can, there's no, think about the value of having an influencer, an influencer driven piece of content in, in digital and social. It's what people expect. They expect to see that. They don't expect to see a glamour shot of a product from that a brand took in a studio. That's not what they're expecting. So use it in paid. Use it in owned and operated channels. A lot of our clients are now using the content, recipe content, all of this other stuff on their item pages for different retailers and on their own sites. So the way that we think about the content is... If you don't, if you only use influencer content to create the awareness and to push it out organically, you are leaving money on the table because you're already investing in the content. Why not optimize it? And you optimize it by by using it in other places. So totally agree with you, but I want to play devil's advocate a little bit and go to the other end of that spectrum. Are you concerned at all? Because I am concerned about this. Are you concerned at all that, you know, pushing for more of a transactional approach from brands is going to dirty the water, if you will. Are we in danger of soiling the social by turning all these feeds into ads? Well, the smart, we just finished a study that's actually going to be published in ad week um, over the course of the next couple of weeks. And what we did was we took a group, we took 
a, a group of influencers and put a survey in front of them, ask them about how much content is, is sponsored on their feed, all, all of these different questions, how they think that their audience reacts to content. And then we did a similar, sur- a, a second survey to the audience of the influencers. And we asked them a series of questions about how they perceive content. Here's the interesting thing. We did this study um, in the past. And what we found is over the last three years, people are more understanding, audiences are more understanding of sponsored content than they were three years ago in in our study. And that's because they understand that these influencers are now becoming creators that they use, that they do this as as a job or for incremental income. So they are more open to seeing content. Now, having said that, sponsored content, now having said that, no influencer who understands their audience is going to push more content, sponsored content at their audience at their audience in their feed than they than they than they should. And um, the influencers we talk to in the study, um, the majority of them do less do probably about twenty five percent of their posts are sponsored content, and those are the ones who do this full time as a living. So they're smart about mixing the content, the sponsored content with regular other content so that their audience doesn't see their feed, however they're looking at their content, as a constant stream of sponsored content. Well, here's hoping that that, that brands understand that dynamic of, of organic versus paid and transactional versus brand, because I still... It just kind of makes my, I get tense when I start to think about transactional influencer marketing stuff, because I'm like, you're starting to push the audience and the influencer content in the wrong direction. I think it's good where it is. Stop screwing with it. But maybe that's just me being a little tense about it. So I'll get over it. Well, yeah. I mean, and I'm curious, how do you, do you, do you see it? Do you see it as different than other media channels or other, other media properties? I do. Um, the only thing that's really, I think, akin to influence marketing in terms of the, the the mix that you need to have is social media. You know, so again, people don't come to social networks to buy things. They come there to see pictures of their kids and grandkids, interact with their friends, you know, maybe see, you know, content news slash whatever that's been memes that have been shared. They don't come there to buy things. If they want to buy things, they go to Google or they go to, you know, Amazon or they go to shopping websites where that's the reason you're there. And so in, in, in influencer marketing, which is obviously rooted on social channels and then in social media, whether it's for your brand or just, you know, for people on social media, I think if you have a transaction uh, methodology first, you're not using the channel the way it's meant to be used, nor the way consumers are using it. And eventually it turns people off and you've got to strike that balance of, and and I hate to use this because the first book I ever wrote, I started out by making fun of Joe Jaffe for, for saying, we just need to join the conversation. And it was playful and it was fun because I was basically saying, you can't just join the conversation. You have to drive business. But now 20 years later or whatever it is, I'm saying, okay, you need to join the conversation and you need to participate in the conversation to have the right to make it about business. Because if you just go at it with, we're all about selling stuff and we're just going to drive product down your throat, that those are the brands that fail. Those are the influencers when, if they are persuaded to use that content that way, they're the ones who lose their audience and who uh, end up going the wrong way. Well, and that's why I think that the influencers who we see have staying power are the ones who recognize that their number one partner are their audience members, are their followers. They don't bow down to the brands. They will push back and say, this isn't going to work for my audience. This what is what will work for my audience. And then it becomes a happy, you know, a happier medium. But at the end of the day, if you're not tending, if you're an influencer and you're not tending to your audience first, then you're going to lose them. There's, there, I, I, com- I, I completely agree with you. We're, we're definitely of like mind there. Uh, real quick, uh, before we wrap things up, you, you actually host your own pretty damn good podcast. Why don't you tell people about that? Sure. Um, well, we launched a podcast uh, during the height of the pandemic because we were finding from our community members, our women were telling us they were feeling burnt out. 
they were feeling uh, uninspired. Uh, you know, people were stuck at home. And uh, yes, there's some benefits to being at home, but there are also, as we all know, so, uh, a lot of downsides to it. And so what we thought, we, we just thought, well, what could we do that might inspire the, these women? And uh, we always found, our, our team always found that hearing other women's stories and how they triumphed, how they failed, how they triumphed, all of those things um, were inspirational. That Hearing that was inspirational. So we started a, a podcast called She Speaks How She Does It, and it's a weekly show. We um, are proud to be very highly rated. We have lots of um, we have lots of different kinds of women on the show. Everyone, everything from actresses to executive producers to authors to influencers, all different kinds of women um, who share an insight. Um, and and share their stories and how they've kind of done what they've done and how they've stumbled and picked themselves up and moved and moved along because that's the one common thing that we find from talking to all of these women we've talked to. Nobody has this guy. Just it's all a simple, you know, straight pot. You know what is that? The hockey puck that they say. I'm very bad at sports metaphors, right. but the, <laughs> the straight line to success. Right? There's there's a lot of stumbles that happen along the way. So. We love to just get women who are open and willing to share their stories. That's fantastic. So uh, tell people where they can find the podcast again. Tell them where they can find She Speaks and how they get involved and where to find you online. Um, you can find She Speaks at shespeaks.com. It's free to join if you're a woman, um, identify as a woman and living in the United States. Um, and so anyone um, anyone interested can certainly do that. Um, and then for me, I am at Elisa Freud on pretty much all of the socials. And uh, for She Speaks, we are at She Speaks Up, I think, on all of the socials. Fantastic. Well, Elisa, thanks for the time today. It's always great to talk shop with uh, somebody a lot smarter than me, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Great stuff. I love it when the ideas that I've developed over the years are mirrored in, in other folks who I consider to be a lot smarter than me. So very validating there. Elise and I sure do agree on a lot of what uh, should be happening in the space. So go find her at shespeaks.com and check out that podcast too. It's called She Speaks, How She Does It. You can find that on all the podcasting places. Speaking of all the places, don't forget to drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcasty place. We're on all of them, I think. Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Good Pods, Podchaser, TuneIt, Listen Notes, Audible, Pandora, Amazon Music. If we are not where you listen, let me know and we will correct that ASAP. You can also listen on the website at winfluencepod.com or at marketingpodcasts.net. But Whatever your app or listening mode, if you're listening to us right now, and yes, you are, look for the stars or ratings on that app or site, tap or click, and let us know how we're doing. Also, if you'd like a deep dive on influence marketing topics every so often, as well as highlighted case studies, creators, and inspiration about influence marketing, subscribe to my email newsletter at jason.online slash subscribe. I send it monthly in general. I've begun work on the next one already, so go to jason.online slash subscribe and get on that list. And I would absolutely love it if you would help me make a future episode of Winfluence awesome. Ask me your question about influence or influence marketing that you would like my answer to or take on. Send me an email to jason at jasonfalls.com. If you're feeling adventurous, and I hope you are, record that question via voice memo on your phone and email me the file. I'll play that back so you're asking the question right here on the show using the recording. Regardless of how you ask it, I may use that comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. But if I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter, or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. And if you need help with your influence marketing strategy, drop me a line at jason at jasonfalls.com. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, 
email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. Hey there, we have got another fantastic marketing podcast for you, if I do say so myself. (laughs) <laughs> I'm Carrie Barrett. I'm the host of the VIQ podcast. VIQ stands for Video IQ. And in each episode, I teach you how to create standout DIY video. I'm talking about turning your phone into a money making machine. And this is for all parts of your funnel social right at the top, all the way down through live streaming at the bottom. And just like this podcast, the VIQ podcast is a proud member of the Marketing Podcast Network. You will love it. Subscribe to the VIQ podcast podcast today. All you-